now I would like to introduce our incredible panelists. So starting with Zach, who is a 20-year serial entrepreneur, has been an executive at Microsoft three times. He now runs Microsoft's accelerators around the world and their first ever Scalarator. So we're excited to talk about the Scalarator today. Uh, we have Rowan as well from GE Ventures, last night named the unit of the year. We have, yes. We have Kerry from Mass Challenge. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, it is a uh, accelerator focused on economic development, which started in Massachusetts. The model was so successful, they've now replicated it in many locations around the world to localize it to that area. Kerry runs the program here in the United Kingdom. So, Finally, we have John McIntyre, who is the Managing Director of the Kauffman Fellows Network. John was formerly at Intel Capital, and then he went on to start Citrix, Citrix's Accelerator, which is one of the first corporate accelerators that I'm aware of. So we have an incredible panel today, and I'm going to hand it off to Rowan to start. Rowan, tell us where new venture creation and corporate acceleration fits inside the CVC framework. Because for those of the CVCs in the audience, they might be thinking about this, where, what's the benefit at GE Ventures, and where does it fit in your strategy? Absolutely. So when I think about venture capital investing, I think about a, a spectrum. So you have starting companies at one end of the spectrum, which is really the kind of incubator type piece. There's accelerating, there's working with companies, there's investing in a company that's well on its way and is really just looking for capital and additional um, help, especially from the corporate side. And then there's late stage, which then merges, frankly, into M&A and BD. So it's all a spectrum. So within GE Ventures, we invest in companies, we accelerate companies, and we enable them with a whole series of tools. But what we also do is start companies. If there's a gap, and we're like, there's a gap, and she's really interested in the gap, let's start a company, let's find entrepreneurs, let's work with them to start a company, and we get, I mean, obviously, from the GE perspective, we ha have higher percent ownership in the companies that we start, but it's really filling gaps for GE. Wow. And so, for Zach, I want to talk about strategic value of the Corporate Accelerator. Zach, where does strategic value fit for Microsoft, and how do you balance the DNA of the existing corporation with these startups who are using the latest technologies, and some of the ones that you accept aren't even on Microsoft technologies? So that's a very easy thing to connect the two, clearly. Now, so when we started the program uh, about four years ago, the idea is how do we connect, reconnect Microsoft to some of the um, emerging developers out there? Lots of companies we didn't have a name for at the time, now we call them unicorns, or great companies that are coming out from all, the, all over the world, and we need to make sure that we reconnect to that great, um, great set of companies that you know, we've had some challenges in the last few years connecting some of them. Um, um, so so we, the Accelerator was, has been a great tool for us to do that, and it's a really uh, a multifaceted asset, as some of our executives call it. Um, as we've created these accelerators around the world, we get now 10,000 applications around the world from places like Bangalore and, and Beijing and, and Tel Aviv and Berlin and London and, um, and Sao Paulo and, and Seattle. Um, so, so we have a proprietary set of signals from all these places that many other companies don't have. And we have very intimate relationship with many of those. So we accept only 2% of these 10,000, but, but we get a very good view of the world uh, based on, on these applications. So that's, um, that's one thing. The other thing, and you asked about the companies that are not using our, our technology. Um, we've found out that this is the best tool for us as a listening tool for uh, developing better products for this new world. So our engineering teams have been highly engaged inside their accelerators working with the startups. And um, if they don't use our tools, there's a reason for it. And then we want to figure it out. Then Eventually, we believe that most of them are going to make the right decision and, and transition. Uh, but uh, it's, it's been a great learning experience for us. Do you incentivize them to make that transition? Yes, we do. Uh, yes. Just asking. Um, yes, but they don't, again, they don't have to. No. But they do get um, a significant offer, and mm -hmm. they, get, uh, they get a significant offer. And uh, the, the most important thing is um, the program, the, the one thing we pride the program for is connecting them with real businesses. So we connect them through the Microsoft channel and through the, uh, the Microsoft machine to real businesses out there in the world. And, and uh, we can only do that through our sales organization, which is incentivized if they use the platform. So that's... Uh, so free access to Azure. Well, so they get $500,000 for three years on the platform okay. if they choose. Um, uh, but uh, 
Um, you and also, most of them do. Most of them choose. You also mentioned to me that by the from the beginning of the program to the end of the program, you're changing the opinions about Microsoft's products, right? These startups. So the startups change their opinions considerably because many of them have not even been open to listen to things that, that have right. came through in the last few years. And through the program, I think we're connecting much, much stronger um, to these ecosystems and through these entrepreneurs. And, and we talked a little bit beforehand about how entrepreneurship is an emotional experience. Being an entrepreneur myself, wow, it's a roller coaster, right? It and is. And when you're there to, to be there for the startups, what type, how, does that, how does that give you maybe a priceless uh, marketing opportunity or priceless partnership opportunity? So and, and this is where maybe it's different than the, the standard CVC model. Because we're, we're there in these stages in a very significant way with them. I can tell you that on an average, every cohort, we have a startup that we help the founder realize he's not the right CEO for his company. So the kind of relationship you build with him and his company is something you can't buy in, 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 in any other way. And they're basically yours for life, it's, uh, as long as they exist. <laughs> that sounds really scary. <laughs> but, but no, it's, but it's in a good way. And, and if, you, if you ask many of them, um, you know, when they got, we have 34 companies that exited already with our portfolio. And you, you ask them um, uh, later on about their success, many of them will say that the people that helped them most significantly early on was Microsoft. So uh, we're, we're very happy to be in that position. It's a very emotional thing. The whole process in them is emotional, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's fun. That's great. And so, Kerry, now on to you. Uh, give the audience a little bit more background about the scale that Mass Challenge is at. You guys do an incredible number of companies in every program. And when, what you guys are focused on creating is really an ecosystem. How do you manage that ecosystem? How do you tap the value of that ecosystem? We're actually, Mike, Mass Challenge is unique. Um, we're an accelerator, but not in the traditional sense. So first of all, we don't take any equity in our startups. Um, we're a nonprofit, so we're a registered UK charity. Um, and instead of taking equity, what we do is we give money back to the startups at the end of the program. So it's a 12-week program, and essentially the startups are competing for cash prizes. In the UK last year, we gave out 500,000 pounds of cash awards. So the top, top startups received 50,000 pounds and a second tier of 25,000 pounds. So an early stage startup actually getting 25,000 or 50,000 pounds of cash is actually a significant amount of money, particularly at the stage of the development. And they've had to give no equity. So the question is really interesting around um, our alumni network and, and what we do to scale. In the UK, we had 90 companies on the program last year, and we'll have 90 companies go on the program this year. Globally, we now have 835 companies across the alumni network, across a range of industries. So we're not industry specific, we're sort of industry agnostic. And we'll take companies from any industry, any, any sector, including not-for-profit and social enterprise as well. Because the mass challenge ethos is around what impact that company or organization will have. Now that, that impact can be on its sector, on its industry, on its customer base, or on society. So that's what we're interested in when we look at and evaluate startups. So we sit in the middle. Because we're a nonprofit and because we're a charity, we don't have a vested interest. We're not competing with investors. We're not competing with corporates. In fact, corporates are what fund Mass Challenge. So our money comes in essentially from corporate environments and we use that money essentially to run the program. So we sit in the middle, we're the center of that innovation ecosystem, and our role in life is really to make those startups successful. We do anything possible to make those startups successful. So we'll work with investors, we'll work with corporates, we'll work with universities, we'll work with governments and government agencies because in many cases they're important. You know, one of our big partners is GCHQ. Um, hello guys, you listening? Um, so, so they, you know, that's not an organization that you typically associate with, with venture or with startups, but actually they've participated in the program since the beginning. So those are the kinds of organizations that, that, that we work with. And we sit in the middle, and then we make things work. We bring corporates together with startups. We help um, universities work with startups. We help corporates meet corporates, actually. We find that actually we, we find a lot of our corporate partners have never met their peers in other organizations. So we facilitate some of those conversations as well. That's fantastic. And so how do you manage such a large network of alumni? How, do you have hundreds of people on your team to manage all these, all these contacts? I wish. Um, so so we're, a start, we're a startup as well. And 
Um, we started seven or eight years ago, um, and actually we now have legacy systems, so we're starting to complain about some of our creaky back-end systems that we thought we could, would work more efficiently. We try to automate as much as we can, because we, we do have large numbers. We have, you know, in the UK, we have 400 mentors on our platform that we have to manage. Uh, we have 2,000 plus applications that we have to manage. We go through judging that takes those 2,000 applications down to 90 finalists, and we have to automate that as much as we can. So we only have 12 people in the UK. So 12 people manage all of that process, plus the back-end systems, plus the delivery teams that run the program over the year. So you're really match.com. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and one thing that was, one thing that was really interesting. Looking for, for, yeah, got it. for startups. Yeah. Got it. One thing that's really interesting, I think, is that you guys actually use your community to vet the companies, right? Yeah, so we, just very simply, when I said we have about 2,000, 2000 applicants that start at the top of the funnel, if you think of it that way, we have um, a global judging platform. It's, it's a global judging platform, so we have judges that sit around the world who are part of the Mass Challenge family who then look at those applications online. So it's an online process, the first stage. Then we whittle down or, or filter those 2,000 applications down to about 250, 300. And those, are, those interviews are done face to face. So at the end of July this year, we'll have five full on days of interviewing 200 to 300 startups. And again, those judges come from the community. They come from our corporate partners. They come, they're entrepreneurs. They're previous entrepreneurs. There are people from, our, from corporates, investors. Um, universities, people who are again all part of the innovation ecosystem, part of that decision-making process because they understand best what is, an, an what is a startup at that early stage and who's best qualified to go in the program. The other two things we do which, which are interesting is because we do things in, in large scale, as much as possible we try to actually match judges to the sectors because a lot of the companies that come onto our program are actually what I call sort of unfundable in the traditional sense. So they might have very, very long time horizons, or they might, have R, they might be R&D intensive businesses. And it's very difficult to actually assess an early stage R&D business against a web business, for example. So we have about 25% of our companies come in, are in life sciences or bio or medical technology. So we have people who, have, who are experts in those industries actually making the assessments of those companies. That's awesome. So, so John, so um, you went from Intel Capital to starting Citrix's Accelerator. A few things in between. I did start. Oh, a, starting your own company as well. My own also very, for, very important. Also worked for a government agency, Enterprise Ireland, where we funded a lot of European uh, startups who came over to the States, and I supported them over there. Fantastic. Yep. And for those who didn't hear my background, I wrote a book on lean startup, right? And yeah. A lot of people have a lot of preconceived notions about lean startup, but you should know that my view on it may be very different than Eric Reese or Steve Blanks. But John, um, very lucky to have you here because you, have a, yeah. you used Lean a lot in your accelerator program. We did. Why? And, and what was the benefit of it? Well, so interesting question when you're running a, or starting a corporate accelerator. And on Monday, we did a pre-conference day uh, just to focus on this phenomenon of corporate accelerators or incubators or whatever you want to call them. And you know, just about every week, I got somebody from another corporation showing up in Silicon Valley saying, you know, why do you have an, uh, an accelerator? You know, what's, how do you measure it? How do you fund it? How do you run it? Um, I know, Zach, you get a lot of this as well. And, and, you know, and, and in conferences like this, we have a chance to talk to this. But five years ago, nobody had really done it. All the kind of incubators that were born in the late 90s and 2000s really died. There wasn't really anything left of that nature. So we started really initially a seed fund. So we were behaving more like a Silicon Valley seed investor. We were evaluating startups. We were looking for startups that were disruptive, not to use our technologies at Citrix, but would, would really have some, something uh, that's in the universe of interest for us, but not directly related to our current strategies. But we, we evaluated one at a time. We did about eight investments a year. Then we started a more traditional accelerator program so we could export that from Silicon Valley three-month program. We did it with other corporations, and uh, we did it in five different locations around the world. But what we found in both of those programs, whether it was three-month or a longer kind of incubation program, was that the startups, by their nature, as mostly engineers, wanted to build stuff. Great. Nothing wrong with smart guys that want to build stuff. 
But you know, I'd always ask the question, what's the most important thing that a startup needs? Trevor, you want to? A customer. They need a customer. It's not funding. It's not a corporate backer. It, it's not even a great team. You do need a great team, of course. But you know, if you don't find initial customers and experiment with those customers, you're not going to get anywhere. So we put a lot of focus on lean. We had debates about lean for enterprise. Uh, my co-founder for the startup uh, was a heavy technologist, and he didn't think that the lean methodology really fit in enterprise, because a lot of the books that Eric and others wrote were really around consumer and webby stuff. So there was this kind of debate we had is, does it really apply in enterprise? I felt very strongly it did, and, and it got proven to us, because we worked with over 100 startup teams over time, and we really be able, we were able to differentiate the teams that clearly got focused on who my customer is and proving that those custom, they could provide a valuable product to those customers, and the teams that just wanted to build stuff and didn't really care. So that's why we put a heavy focus on Lean. And so also you had some personal experience in your own startup. Yeah, maybe, yeah. So, um, and and you also there. working with uh, you know, the European <laughs> startups, it's just, it, it, it is the inclination naturally and it happened in my startup. We actually got funded in about 10 years ago in 2004. We got money from uh, Enterprise Ireland. We did our development over here in Ireland. But then we were selling mostly in the US and we were able to raise 13 million A round. So back then, the, the rounds were bigger. And so we raised all this money and guess what? We just took that money and we built stuff. No. Yep. Really? And so um, we had lots of engineers building lots of interesting products. Uh, but we weren't doing a good job of going and seeing is that what the customers want. We did it initially, pre-funding. Once we got the money, we're like, okay, let's just build the stuff and then hire a sales team and let them figure out what the customers want, which is anti-lean, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And, and one thing you mentioned is that to you, lean is almost like a, an intelligence check maybe for the entrepreneur. How much are they in love with their idea or how much are they actually thinking about the market? Yeah. I have a favorite story here that I can tell. Well, how about we'll leave that to the okay, questions right. and, or to the after. But I'm going to open up to questions in one second. So get ready with your questions. I want to ask Rowan one more question. Your focus is on healthcare. And when I think about acceleration, I'm thinking tech stars, which my company went through. Three months, we have to get to market. We have to get investors in three months. Healthcare, oh my gosh, three months, that's, a very, that's too short in healthcare. So how do you think about the regulation in healthcare? and in terms of new venture creation versus the typical web, webby stuff that John meant brought up? Well, healthcare is pretty broad. OK, so give me maybe an example of uh, investment in healthcare uh, on the early I'll give, stage. I'll give you an example of companies Great. that we started from GE. Perfect. So num first company we started, a um, company called Evidation Health, which is consumer meets healthcare. It's a software company applied to population health. Started that company a year and a half ago, and it's well into revenue, well into customer traction. So I, I don't know. That's, and that's what, was a, the, what was the timeline and funding requirements for that? Um, so we looked at starting the company in June 2014. We did a whole series of customer analysis, business development, funded the company. I know exactly, 2 p.m., December 31st on 2014. Ooh. I know because it was that December was when, the 31st. That was when the money left the bank account? Or that the, money the, left the, bank, the money left G at 2 p.m. on December the 31st, 2014. Okay. I know because I pressed the button. So. <laughs> I know who, to, know who to call next time. No. Yeah, no, I know who to call. And um, what I was told by the other VCs who were doing it with us is like, there's no way GE is going to close by the end of the year. I Ooh. said, you just wait and see. They didn't close by December the 31st. <laughs> just got to tell you, they couldn't get their act together. So Fantastic. that's, but that's, that's in, I would call it in um, consumer health, transition to value-based care, which is IT meets healthcare. And how much capital did they, did you, did they raise in that round? I don't think that's disclosed, okay. but a few million. So, okay. um, and they just closed their Series B, very um, right. great valuation, significantly large cap, um, right. capital, all due to customer traction in the last year and a half. Right. Another example, if you're going to go on the pure therapeutics route, you can't do that quick customer interaction, because guess what? Yeah. You're not allowed to inject something <laughs> into a human unless you go through the process. So that's something where I don't, well, I think yeah. Lean works yeah. very well in terms of, are you making the right milestone-based funding? 
but in terms of customer interaction. But then, for example, second company that we started is a company where we spun a whole set of technology, IP out of GE, but it was pretty well developed, and we just needed the team to take this technology, apply to the right customer. Mm. And again, with the kind of lean methodology, that one we funded nine months ago, and they're just signing their first customer up now which, again, they spent nine months iterating yeah. with a variety of customers, but they're signing their customer up. Third company um, that we started and we launched six weeks ago um, is about to sign up their first customer, but again, it's been a whole period of time of iteration back and forth with the customers. Right. So we, we believe in customer, but we believe in team and milestone-based funding. Right. And it just depends. Healthcare is pretty broad. So, yeah, and, yeah, and GE, I assume, offers many resources to these internal ventures that maybe I can't get as an individual outside of by myself. Absolutely. I mean, what we've tried to do is the, in terms of setting up a um, corporate VC environment is, yes, we're there with money to invest, but we're there with connections to our business unit for channel, for channel connections to our licensing for access to intellectual property, connections to actually G individuals. And people, I was a little suspicious, because remember, I've been a startup <coughs> person, traditional venture capitalist. I was like, why would the startup want some kind of old G person in their business? That's kind of what I thought. Right. But actually, the startups love it. And what they do is they compete for G personnel to come into Ooh. their company for six to nine months because those people bring a tremendous process amount of market knowledge or finance knowledge that the startup can get in them for free. And we have a whole program <laughs> around that. The other things that we do is we set up Roadshows to China, for example, introduce the startup. So, um, a robotics company wanting to go into all the manufacturing plants in China. How hard is that for a startup to do by themselves? Pretty darn difficult. So, but GE, again, they, they, they apply for this and they have to compete I can, for access. I can, I can add something about one of our startups' yeah. relationships with GE, actually. Oh, great. Um, oh, so is it good or bad? It, oh, it's, <laughs> oh, it's a good story, okay. actually. It's a great story. So, one of our startups last year, they saw, they're trying to solve a really big problem, i.e., save babies' lives, so premature babies' lives by developing an incubator uh, for premature babies. So a typical incubator costs $25,000. They're trying to create an incubator for $1,000. So that's pretty significant. So guys comes out of Loughborough University. He's really early stage. Um, he joins the program. Um, he's in contact with people like GE and Philips around uh, medical equipment. Um, that other company. That other company. Anyway, they have this long conversation with G, and G says, let me introduce you to one of our staff members um, who actually worked on the MRI project on reducing the cost of MRIs from two or $300,000 to $20,000 for emerging markets. Anyway, long story short, this guy loved the company so much, he left GE and joined Mom's Incubators as the co-founder and CTO. Um, so, because, but important is he has 10 years of experience in GE, so he understands the whole manufacturing process, he understands the, the process of re-engineering, uh, and there's a strong relationship now between Mom Incubator and GE and the ability um, for GE to sort of open doors. And that's what we do at Mass Challenge, so we work with people like GE, and actually in Boston, we worked with the city of Boston also to help GE move its headquarters from um, from somewhere in Connecticut to Boston. So that's a, another interesting relationship that, that we as an organization have because of, of who we work with and what we do. So you really were doing Match.com for people. Uh, right? uh, yeah, another example of Match.com, yeah. <laughs> okay, let's turn to the audience. Any questions that you have for our amazing panelists? Rowan, I was quite intrigued by this. I'd like to hear Zach and uh, John's answer as well. Um, the, he just brought up a really interesting point. So this person left GE to become the CTO. Um, I was wondering how much opposition you get in your organizations of getting really super smart people coming outside while you're doing the accelerator. And this was coming up at the issue in the session we yep. organized with John and Trevor and Zach uh, the other day. Yep. It, it, the sort of what, what's the attitude in most corporations um, so, yeah, we had a lot of questions when we launched some of our programs because we invited some of our entrepreneurs into some of our programs, too. And the attitude is, listen, if these people are good, they're going to leave anyway. All right? So why don't we provide a program where they can actually do something with the company or in support of the company as opposed to trying to hold on to them? Because we're not going to hold on to them, particularly in the kind of employment market we've been in the last few years. So. 
in trying to change cultures of big companies, that's a, you know, a whole other conversation to have, these types of innovation programs can be really effective to help the employees get into programs while they're still involved in the company. And probably the high majority, maybe 90% of the internal startups uh, aren't going to work out anyway, but they go back to their jobs refreshed. So they're probably not going to leave, but if they do leave, they were probably going to leave anyway. And if they stay, they're going to be somewhat refreshed. So, absolutely, and, and um, we had you know, hundreds of, of internal people engaged, wanted to be engaged. It creates a lot of great energy, and as we're in this culture shift in Microsoft, it's really worked well in that. Uh, we had a case of, of uh, a team that left Microsoft because their, the whole thing that they want to develop was cut below the line of what they planned on, uh, uh, on the features for the product we're developing, so they left Microsoft. They joined the accelerator, uh, and they were acquired back. Uh, so they made some money, uh, and they got their product in. I think everyone were happy in, in, this, yeah. in this scenario. So we have one case like this. Uh, um, we well, don't that was, see... That's the Cisco special. Yeah. That's yeah. the Cisco special. They constantly... <laughs> that's the Cisco special. Yeah. They, they the constantly Cisco do that. The, the Cisco no, special. so we don't constantly do that, but we have one case like this. But, but uh, again, the people that would leave are going to leave anyways, uh, giving your employees an opportunity to be engaged in that kind of remind, environment is, is great. So, so I, want, I want to take a moment and um, put out the concept of the distributed workforce. No smart company can hire all the smart people in the world. It just doesn't happen. If you have the ability to have these companies, these accelerators, where you're pulling people from outside, matching with people inside, you get a natural connectivity. So sometimes it's people inside, sometimes it's outside. We bring in entrepreneurs and residents all the time, which are external people to come work with us to help solve a problem. And would those people come and work for GE? Maybe not. Will they come and work with us? Absolutely. And when you think about a distributed workforce, the average um, time of a software engineer in Silicon Valley is like 18 months per company. So we're not going to hire them for a 20-year career at GE. Not sure we want to either. We want to get the refresh and the connectivity with that whole ecosystem of entrepreneurs and inventors, because we can't hire them all. We are out of time, guys. Thank you so much, panelists.